Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be talking to you today about complications of acute amy. I don't know if I will be teaching you uh, much about this. I, I've learned a lot about the complications of acute amy among many of the speakers who preceded me. So I will try to do uh, some fairness to the topic. Move this which way. Yeah. So there are four types of acute amy complications. There are hemodynamic disturbances, uh, of which there are four types, LV failure, isolated RV failure, cardiogenic shock, and mechanical complications. There are also pericardial complications, there are peri electrical complications, and some other miscellaneous complications like LV aneurysm, pulmonary embolism, and LV thrombus slash embolism. I'll be focusing mostly for the sake of time on hemodynamic disturbances, and I want to start uh, with the really most dreadful, but uh, the least common complications, which are the mechanical complications. And the reason behind that, I really want you to be familiar with those. Uh, you may not see uh, a lot of them during your training or uh, during your uh, uh, career course, but you need to recognize those. These are highly lethal and fortunately uh, very low in incidence. They happen maybe in the range of 0.5 to 1%. So we have three major mechanical complications of acute MI. We have LV free wall rupture, uh, interventricular septal rupture, and uh, mitral regurg. And the main state treatment has always been surgical repair with revascularization, preferably with cabbage. Uh, nowadays, we have percutaneous circulatory assist device, which really help uh, bridge these patients and make uh, surgical repair and revascularization much safer. So the incidence, uh, this is from a decade ago, from the APEX uh, acute MI trial. Um, uh, at that time, the incidence was less than 1%. It was 0.91%. I submit to you, nowadays, with improved timeliness of reperfusion and uh, mechanical assist devices, it's even lower. But if you observe over here the um, mortality, and again, this is from almost a decade ago, the 30 or the 90 days survival if you've got a mechanical complication is in the range of 40% compared to 95% plus uh, survival post MI without mechanical complication. So really very dreadful uh, and very lethal uh, 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 complication of acute MI. Let us start dissecting those. And the first of those is the LV free wall rupture. It usually occurs within first five days after MI and more than 90% occur within uh, two-week period post MI. It has a bimodal uh, phase, uh, really. And its clinical presentation is a triad of either sudden cardiac death or hemopericardium leading to tamponade and then death. And very infrequently, it can have an incomplete subacute rupture and indolent course. And the management, you diagnose with an echocardiogram. And if there's a hemopericardium, you would want to do controlled pericardiosynthesis if needed and immediate surgery, of course, with support. Um, and we will talk about mechanical circulatory support in, in a short while. Now, the second one is ventricular septal wall rupture, and it usually occurs three to five days post-acute AMI, uh, and usually it's ranged between 24 hours up to two weeks. It occurs in equal frequency in the anterior and non-anterior locations, and with anterior MI, it's usually affecting the apical septum. With inferior MI, it usually occurs at the base. And these are the clinical manifestations. You have, obviously, quick hemodynamic compromise with acute hypotension by ventricular failure. And you have a new uh, harsh, loud holosystolic murmur and a palpable thrill in 50% of the patients with RV lifts and hyperdynamic precordium. Now, again, the management is the same. After stabilization with percutaneous circulatory assist devices, it's surgical repair. Oops. It's surgical repair uh, uh, and uh, possibly revascularization. And if you do a concomitant capture of it, you've got associated improved survival. Now, there has been some controversy as to when is the perfect timing for uh, surgery. And uh, the data were biased by retrospective analysis showing that uh, you've got lower operative mortality if you operate. Uh, more than six weeks because you allow uh, the tissue to heal and you allow better uh, 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 surgical techniques and patching of the 
uh, VSD. Uh, however, this is biased by the fact that those who were able to wait for a few weeks are likely to have uh, uh, survived, and there's a survivor bias over here. Nowadays, stabilization with PVAD or circulatory acid devices, taking the cast lab for delineating the anatomy and then surgical repair is really the mainstay treatment. This is a case from a few years back uh, of uh, VSD uh, uh, in a patient who had a prior cabbage and I believe, I can't recall his exact clinical scenario, but I believe he had no lima to the LED and um, uh, came in with an acute AMI in the native uh, circulation in the left main of the LED. Uh, and this is the LA tracing. And, the, I, uh, and you see the very large V wave. This is tracing uh, over 50 millimeter. You see a V wave 30, 35 millimeter. Now, how could you access the left atrium? Uh, it's uh, 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 the ideal, uh, uh, not surrogate, but the ideal uh, way to uh, do a, uh, uh, a right heart uh, left heart catheterization is really to access the uh, left atrium rather than do its surrogate uh, wedge pressure. Uh, the only way we were able to access the uh, left atrium because we had a transeptal puncture across the intraatrial septum during a tandem heart uh, support device for this patient as we were uh, fixing uh, or uh, repairing percutaneously uh, his uh, VSD. So you see here the uh, tandem heart 17 French cannula across the intraatrial septum through which you saw this tracing with a large uh, V wave. And uh, you see coming from the right side, from the right ventricle all the way into the left ventricle, we have the amplatzer device, which uh, we were uh, deploying initially in the left side uh, and then into the right uh, side, and we had a very good opposition. Now, this uh, was only feasible safely, and the patient did very well, actually, uh, for a few years post-procedure, only because of this uh, large assist device which was really at that time uh, uh, giving uh, probably 4.5 to 5 liter per minute. You could really shut down the aortic valve with such a tremendous uh, mechanical circulatory assist device. Uh, now the third mechanical complication is acute MR, and these are the cause of acute MR post MI. You have LV dilatation, you can have ischemic papillary muscle dysfunction and papillary muscle rupture. And remember, uh, although you hear holosystolic murmur, Sometimes, if you have early equalization of the LVDP and the left atrial pressures from free-flowing uh, uh, mitral regurg, uh, in 50% or so of the time, you really have a soft, short, uh, indistinct murmur. And uh, remember that the posterior medial papillary muscle gets affected much more than the uh, anterior papillary muscle because of its uh, single artery supply by the PDA, while the anterolateral papillary muscle has a dual supply from the LED and the left circ. Clinical manifestations very similar to the others, acute hypotension, pulmonary edema, hyperactive precordium, and uh, holosystolic murmur, and then the giant V wave, which is really not very specific. You see it with VSD, you see it with severe heart failure, and then it's a clinical uh, diagnosis, and then you corroborate your diagnosis with trans uh, esophageal echocard transthoracic echocardiogram, although in one third of the time you uh, may need a TEE because uh, the rupture heads may be uh, uh, prolapsing to the left atrium and you would want uh, a TEE to visualize this most posterior structure of the heart. Then after stabilization, you go to the cardiac cath lab, you go to the cardiac cath lab to insert a mechanical support device, delineate the coronary anatomy, and then following which emergent surgical intervention with concomitant cabbage is the way to go. So this is about mechanical complications post MI. Hopefully you won't see many of those, but you need to do a good physical exam at the bedside, a good bedside echo and emergency cardiac cast, circulatory acid device and uh, revascularization and repair. Now the second hemodynamic disturbance is really LV failure. And uh, as you know, LV function is the single most important predictor of mortality after acute MI. And with acute MI, you have both systolic and diastolic dysfunctions, thus having contributing to uh, congestion and diminishing in cardiac outputs. And although positive inotropes may be useful, they're obviously not the initial treatment of choice. If you can, you would want to unload the heart initially if you have uh, enough blood pressure to reduce the afterload and the preload uh, if the patient is not uh, with low blood pressure or with a pre-shock or cardiogenic shock. And obviously, you want to avoid arrhythmias and uh, hopefully uh, maintain uh, sinus rhythm. 
uh, oxygen for hypoxemic patients with LV failure diuretics, but you don't want to reduce your preload uh, 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 much. You want to be operating on the uh, right uh, side of the frank Sterling curve and maybe avoiding any LVDP below 18 millimeter. Uh, you would want to reduce the LV afterload while avoiding hypotension. In shock now, we say MAP of 65 is what's acceptable and the systolic blood pressure of 90 millimeter. These are mostly from septic shock trial, really more than cardiogenic shock. And again, avoid excessive reduction of LV pressures, maintaining a wedge or LVDP of 18 millimeter or so. If you can unload the heart with a combination of nitroprusside, a potent arterial vasodilator, and nitroglycerin, nitroglycerin to preload the heart, that would be the way to go. Then you transition to oral agents. However, if you can't, you would need to resort to inotrope plus or minus vasopressors. Uh, dopamine, only use it at a very low dose, below 5 milligram, microgram actually, below 5 microgram per kilo per minute. And at these low doses, it's really a visceral, the renal and splanking vessels and has very minimal positive inotropic uh, effect and minimal or, or uh, uh, moderate, I would say, uh, uh, vasopressor effect. But real inotropes are really, of course, dobutamine and midrenone. Uh, uh, dobutamine uh, has much more entropic actions than dopamine, less chrontropic effects, so less tachyarrhythmia, less increase in myocardial oxygen demand. Uh, and it, however, can cause hypotension and not invariably you'd want to use it with a very low dose uh, dopamine. And milirone is an alternative, especially when you have pulmonary hypertension because it really is an excellent pulmonary vasodilator. Uh, in cardiogenic shock in particular, there have been studies, well, it's uh, all shock uh, uh, comers, uh, dopamine had uh, increased mortality compared to norepinephrine uh, and in the subset of patients uh, uh, with cardiogenic shock, this increase in mortality was most obvious. So uh, dopamine is no longer the vasopressor slash inotrope uh, modality of choice in cardiogenic shock. You would want to go with norepinephrine. Cardiogenic shock, I know that you might have had a lecture on cardiogenic shock, so I'm going to go very quickly over this. 80% of uh, cardiogenic shock is really related to pump failure and 20% is related to mechanical complication or isolated R RV, uh, right ventricular MI. Now, I want to remind you that two-thirds to three-fourths of cardiogenic shock occur in hospital. So often these patients do not present with cardiogenic shock, but rather have the shock happening either because of delay in revascularization, iatrogenic beta blocker, or incomplete revascularization, and so forth. Uh, these are the triads definition of cardiogenic shock. Persistent hypotension, systolic less than 80, MAP less than 65, uh, cardiac index acutely less than 1.8 liter per minute per meter square, and uh, elevated LVDP of more than 18. And with this, you have also low output state, uh, hypoperfusion, so lactate, a surrogate of tissue hyperperfusion is usually elevated above two. Uh, there are multiple types of cardiogenic shock. There's the pre-shock, there's a regular cardiogenic shock, and then there's a profound shock or severe refractory cardiogenic shock. All comers mortality probably in the range of uh, 40, 50%, but severe or profound cardiogenic shock can have a mortality of 70 to 80 percent. The classic paradigm is you've got diminished cardiac output and pulmonary congestion, hyperperfusion, but at, at in severe refractory cardiac shock, you can have also systemic inflammatory response and increased nitric oxide release, and paradoxically, you have a vasodilation with extreme shock. So when you measure the SVR, it's really low. This is now historic. This is Judy Hockman from 1999. Uh, demonstrating in this NIH small study of 300 patients or so that uh, revascularization, early revascularization is superior to medical therapy in these patients. Uh, and at one month, there was a strong trend. At six months, there was a 13% absolute risk reduction. The benefit of early revascularization was evident across all subgroups. And it seems that the elderly subgroup was underpowered to detect a difference. We subsequently did a meta-analysis with one of our fellows who's now faculty in, uh, uh, in Louisiana at Ochsner, Paul Rogers, who showed in observational studies that the survival benefit with early revascularization is maintained uh, across uh, 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 in patient above 75 years of age uh, when appropriately selected patients. Uh, this is a case of cardiogenic shock related to MI. You could see the diminished pulse pressure and the systolic uh, uh, hypotension. And I want to show you this because I want to tell you that maybe shock complicates 7%, 6 
to 8% of all MI, but that prior case I just showed you is a case of non-ST elevation MI, which can be complicated in 2-3% with cardiogenic shock. So not all cardiogenic shock are related to ST elevation MI. Severe uh, uh, disease in the ramus and the LED, and uh, uh, this is how his RCA looks like. You see here we immediately had a, uh, an impella percutaneous support device, and we proceeded with complete revascularization. There's a lot of hype right now about the benefit of complete revascularization with both ST elevation MI and non-ST elevation MI. And the guidelines, we say it's class 2A. I've reviewed the evidence. I participated on some of these writing committees. Small trials corroborating their and supporting the need of complete revascularization in both acute ST and non-ST elevation MI. In cardiogenic shock, the impetus is even stronger, although the data are lacking. They're data that are currently being generated. Support devices, we've got four support devices, starting with a balloon pump and ending with a percutaneous cardiopulmonary bypass. I'm not going to talk much about this. This really does not unload the heart. Actually, actually it increases the afterload of the heart, uh, but it can oxygenate, uh, uh, and it's life-saving for a venous uh, massive uh, pulmonary embolism in other modalities. The real unloading of the heart are really the impella and the tandem heart, and the balloon pump uh, is an older modality ubiquitous. You can maybe insert it within seven to eight French systems. And now we have the bigger balloon pumps, 50 cc. It has minimal effect on unloading the heart, increase the coronary circulation. And probably this is the best effect, increase the coronary circulation in patients who received thrombolytic therapy when they transferred from non-PCI capable hospitals to a PCI capable hospitals. But overall in cardiogenic shock, the effect on cardiac output is very minimal. It's in the best hands and best calculations that I've seen, they increase the cardiac output but any, by anything between 0.5 to 0.9 liter per minute. This is the shock 2 trial in 2012. At 30 days, there was no benefit in acute MI-related cardiogenic shock from balloon pump versus standard therapy. And this lack of benefit on survival was maintained at 12 months. So really, balloon pump in regular cardiogenic shock does not do much. Some people argue with acute MR, the European a guideline static class 2A, and there's some argument to use it in the absence of these circulatory assist devices. Now, tandem heart is now being used less and less frequently because of the advancement advances in impella, but as you know, you unload the heart by unloading the left atrium. It's a 17 uh, French cannula uh, arterially, and it's a 21 French venous, and you unload the heart from uh, the venous system, and then uh, uh, go back to the uh, iliofemoral where you can uh, uh, insert the flow uh, or uh, uh, return the blood. Now, uh, two years ago, the tandem heart had an oxygenator that can be uh, uh, attached to it and it really can act as an ECMO technically. And you don't really need to use a transeptal uh, cannula. You could pull back to the uh, venous side and use it just as an ECMO. Uh, Impella is really the new kid in the block. It's been there for 10 years, really, but uh, now we've got a lot of advances. We have an RV support with the Impella. Uh, we have uh, 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 higher degrees of lead ventricular support. We have the CP, the cardiac power, which can give you up to 3.2, 3.5 liter per minute. It's 14 French, and it unloads the lead ventricle directly. You'd want to avoid using it in uh, when you have a thrombus or severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, Dr. Shah, my time is okay? Can I? Perfect. Um, so these are about the hemodynamic, hemodynamic disturbances. I will take a few minutes to talk very quickly about the rest. Pericardial complications, fortunately, we don't see them enough. You'd want to, uh, uh, there are three types. These are the three types, uh, pericarditis, pericardial effusion, and postcardiac injury. Uh, pericarditis used to be much more common uh, with uh, the era of ST elevation MI, that's delayed reperfusion. Uh, and you, at that time, it has some prognostic uh, implication, but nowadays we don't. Uh, hearing it up doesn't mean much because everyone gets an echo. And uh, you all know about how to diagnose it. It's a good set of clinical diagnosis, plus or minus echocardiogram. And very importantly, you can anticoagulate these patients unless they have a pericardial effusion. You would want to avoid anticoagulation out of the risk of hemorrhagic transformation. And please avoid non surgical anti-inflammatory drugs in the immediate post-MI period because of conceptually impairs healing and free wall rupture. Very minimal risk, but an existent risk. Again, these patients have acute kidney injury. You'd want to avoid these medications. And best is to use aspirin and colchicine. 
Dressler syndrome is an autoimmune uh, phenomenon that occurs several weeks after MI and usually uh, uh, treated best with non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs because it occurs a few weeks afterwards and even may need some corticosteroids. Uh, pleuritic symptoms, fever, and elevated ESR is what characterizes this post-cardiac injury syndrome. Again, we don't see it as much because of improve, improved reperfusion and we don't see as many large transurian MIs anymore. Arrhythmias, I won't deal uh, much into this. Uh, they're all in your handouts because of the sake of time. I just want to tell you that the two most important consideration is the you want to maintain some heart rates uh, because uh, you would want to uh, maintain a good cardiac output in the absence of a post MI when stroke volume is really uh, compromised. Uh, this, these patients may depend on heart rates to generate a good cardiac output and be mindful of uh, maintaining sinus rhythm because in a failing heart or a post MI heart, the atrial con kick contribution to the cardiac output is much more than the usual 20% in uh, usual patients. And with this, I'm going, how is the time, Dr. Shah? Unfortunately, I don't have my we'll have phone. Ask you later on. Excellent, excellent. So with this, I want to thank you all for your kind attention. I want to wish you all good luck. And I'm available at the end of the lecture to answer any questions. Thank you very, very much.